The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we are going into Revelation chapter 3. As you know, we're, we're taking one day apiece to go through each chapter of the book of the Revelation. So today we're going into Revelation chapter 3. Tomorrow will be 4, 5, 6. And then we'll just keep continuing as we go through the book of the Revelation. Now, I always encourage this, I'm going to continue to say this every day that we talk about Revelation, is that there is so much information in each one of these chapters. I mean, each of these chapters deserve two, three, four hours of teaching a piece on them. But there's a reason why we're only doing them in just a short 30 minutes every day. It's because we have an end times curriculum part one and an end times curriculum part two, which the main focus of both of those uh, curriculums is to study the book of the Revelation. Now they have more information in them also, but the main focus is Revelation. So because of all of the other information that we have, I mean, we have a, I mean, I would say it's a minimum of 60 extra hours of teaching on this book specifically. By the end of the year, we might have something around the neighborhood of 100 to 150 hours of teaching on Revelation itself. We're not going to go through these in that big of detail. So that's why I encourage you, go onto the website, buy the End Times Curriculum Part 1, buy the End Times Curriculum Part 2, and study along with us as we go through uh, the book of the Revelation. Now today we're going to talk about the last three and final churches. Now, the church of Sardis and the church of Laodicea, the church of Philadelphia also, but the, those two churches, the church of Sardis and the church of Laodicea, has two of the greatest revelations in the entire Bible. And, and I, I feel like I say that every single day when I talk about end time scripture, but it's, it's just so prevalent today because that Laodicean spirit is in the church. It's that Laodicean spirit of compromise that we're going to be talking about as we go through the lesson today, along with the understanding of Jesus the Judge. Now, Jesus the Judge is a powerful lesson in and of itself. We spent an entire week on that in the fall of 2022, where we just talked about Jesus the Judge and Him being a righteous judge. Because the truth is, Jesus is a bridegroom, king, and judge. It's all three facets. He's not just a king with power and authority. He's not just a bridegroom with desire for intimate desire for a relational partnership. He is also a judge. And, he, and he's a righteous judge who judges in love. And he judges righteous judgment, not according to the outward appearance, but according to the inward part of the heart. So we got lots of teaching on Jesus being the judge, but that is exemplified in Revelation chapter 3. Now, Revelation chapter 3 is also... The consummation, it is the finale of the seven churches. Now, yesterday we talked about the first three churches, which is Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and Thyatira. And just as a quick review of those four churches, the church of Ephesus was leaving your first love or laying it aside, meaning Jesus is no longer first place. The church of Smyrna was about the fact you will go through tribulation, remain faithful. The church of Pergamos is the doctrine of Balaam, which is compassing of fornication and idolatry. And we know that fornication 
opens the door to idolatry. And I tell people all the time, it's it's you get wrapped up in 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 fornication with a woman of a strange land. And I know that's probably that's just one way to say that. I mean, let's say it better than that. Somebody outside of covenant with the Lord, you're having sex outside of marriage. She's not a believer. She doesn't follow the Lord. She does uh, astrology and horology and all of these different strange religions and witchcraft. And because of sex with that woman, it will take your heart into participating with her in the idolatry. That's the message of the doctrine of belong. And And Jesus says, I hate that. Don't participate. Jesus calls us as the body of Christ not to participate in that. You're not supposed to participate in fornication at all. One man, one woman, under covenant, in marriage, under God. That's God's way of doing things. Anything else is immorality in God's opinion. Not in God's opinion, according to God's word. That's what God says it is. And we have no right to define it or change the definition of it because we did not make it. God made the institution of marriage. God created sex. God created the human earth. So it is God's right to decide what he defines as right and wrong when it comes to the physical act of sex. It's not man's definition. No matter how much the gay agenda or the transgender movement or or culture or society or even the laws of a nation, they cannot dictate the definition of what that is according to God. God defined it. One man and one woman under covenant, under God, in marriage. Now, we also looked yesterday at the church of Thyatira, and we ran out of time as we were closing in that lesson of Thyatira. But if you remember, the message that Jesus gave to the church of Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2 is the exact same message that the prophet Hosea prophesied against the nation of Israel. It's participating in adultery. It's participating or playing the harlot. That's the spirit of Jezebel. The spirit of Jezebel is not a spirit of control. I've told people that, and yet months later they'll go, that woman has the spirit of Jezebel, and she's just all controlling. That's not the spirit of Jezebel. The spirit of Jezebel is not about control. The spirit of Jezebel is about immorality. That's what the spirit of Jezebel is all about. And Jesus told us, don't participate. But the greatest promise in that passage of the church of Thyatira is I gave her space to repent. Even Jezebel got space to repent. And that's why over and over when we study the prophetic scriptures, I continue to reiterate it, that there are promises, there are eternal rewards, and there is repentance given to you as long as you're still alive. If you, the Bible says it's declared unto one, it's, it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. If you haven't died yet, you're not facing the judgment. So there is still space to repent. That's why our role as messengers and believers and servants of the Most High God are to declare this truth, not to beat you over the head with it, but to call you to repentance. Because all of the things that you're doing will lead to death. They don't lead to life. There is no fulfillment in drugs or in alcohol, or in illicit sex, or in money, or in promotion, those things will not do it. Uh, you, you could seek after money, you could have sex with strange women, you could, and we're not talking about, when we say strange women, these could be beautiful women. I mean, they could be models, yet they're strange women because they don't serve the Most High God. That's what we're referring to when we talk about this. Now, we just took a minute to overview that, and It moves my heart every time I talk about it, so I just want to continue to reiterate these truths. But go with me to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to pray, and then we're going to jump right into the lesson as we want to talk about the last of the seven churches, the last three churches. So, Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your Son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, Growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We'll go with me to Revelation chapter 3. And let's just read through the passage and then we will uh, overview these churches for just a minute. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. 
I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept, thy, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will also keep thee from an hour of temptation, which shall come upon the whole world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I have come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, and no man take thy crown, him that overcometh will I make him a pillar in the temple of God, and he shall go no more out. But I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him a, my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So because then art, thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel, to me, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes slate that thou mayest see, as many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, the final three churches of the seven are as powerful as the four that came before that. And if you remember, I've already said it, but the End Times Curriculum Part 1 goes through each of these churches in way more detail. I mean, we spend an hour, hour and a half, sometimes two hours on each one of these churches. So this is painting my heart to only be able to go through this in just a few short minutes for each of these churches but i'm hoping to give you just a a brief overview and hopefully spark your interest to study these more go onto our website and 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 go under our end times curriculums and you can find the videos and you can buy the curriculum and get get more information on these truths but let's talk about these uh, churches. So the first church is Sardis. Now the church about Sardis that I want you to understand, the big revelation of Sardis is he that hath the seven spirits of God. Now this might not make any sense at a quick glance, and especially if you haven't studied uh, the Old Testament all, and if maybe this is your first encounter of end time prophecy, and you haven't, maybe you're joining us for the very first time today, and you, and maybe you're a new believer, and you're like, "Hey, I'm I'm starting to watch these things, but I don't really know what that means." The seven spirits, because the seven spirits of God is not just Jesus has all seven manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Now that's what that means. There are before the throne of God seven lampstands burning, and they are the seven spirits of God. Now there is not seven different spirits. There is one Holy Spirit in seven manifestations. There are seven manifestations 
of the Holy Spirit. Now, you can get the names of all of those are, are the different ways in which the Spirit manifests in Isaiah chapter 11. And that's where you see the seven spirits of God. But what I want you to see more than just what are the seven spirits, that's part of the revelation. The greatest part of the revelation of he who has the seven spirits of God is the fact that he who has has now the ability or the right to judge. And that's the revelation of Isaiah chapter 11. And you can go and read that on your own. But Isaiah 11 goes through the seven spirits. And at the end of it, it says, Because the reason in which you have them, the reason in which the seven spirits of God are given unto Jesus, the implication of Jesus holding the seven spirits of God is that because he has them, he had now has the right to judge. And that's the part I want you to understand about the church of Sardis. Jesus says, I see the inward part of your life. I see the things that need to be repented of. I look at the inward part of the heart. Because in the church of Sardis, there are people that say they're alive, but yet are dead. That right there, I, I mentioned it yesterday for a second with the church of Smyrna, but it's really the revelation of the church of Sardis, where people will say, I'm whitewashed tombs, yet there's dead bones on the inside of you. That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He said, you're a hypocrite. Though on the outside you look white, on the inside you're dead bones. But the only way I have the right to be able to call out the dead bones on the inside, to judge you at the inward level of the heart, is I must have the seven spirits of God. And that's the revelation of the church of Sardis. When I saw that, it changed everything. Because now that we understand, you know, we talk about, oh, Jesus is a judge, he has a right to judge. But it's not just being a judge, it's judging righteous judgment. That's the most important part, is that you can be a judge in the natural sense here on the earth, but there's bad verdicts in judgment all the time here on the earth because man is flawed, man is sinful. You know, how could somebody from the leader of a motorcycle gang who, who was the author and he was the, the person that, that uh, commanded and did those things to kill other people get off free? How could he win the trial? You know, man does not have the wisdom, nor the resolve, nor the understanding and the judgment and counsel and might and all of the seven spirits to be able to look at the inward part of the heart and to judge it for what it is. Not what it looks like on the outside, what it is on the inward part of the heart. And Jesus says, I am that judge. I'm the righteous judge. I judge according to the inward part of your heart. I evaluate what's on the inside because my eyes are like flames of fire. I see what's on the inside and I have the seven spirits of God and I am in a position to judge you. Now the word judge, very much misunderstood by a lot of people, the word judge means to execute a verdict or it's, it's to pronounce a sentence. The judge doesn't actually execute the verdict, meaning that judge, we always hear the, the phrase judge, jury, and executioner. Now, Jesus will bring forth the execution of the judgment of God. We understand that. But as a judge, it's not about the actual execution of the judgment as it is about the pronouncing of the sentence. Being able to evaluate the evidence, evaluate the, the part of your heart on the inside, and then to say, this is the result. That's why Jesus says, repent. Repent. And that word repent... Remember, it's to change your thinking. It's to change the inward part. It doesn't mean your outward action is going to change immediately. There's a lot of times people say, well, I have chosen to not watch pornography anymore. And, 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 I, and I have set my heart to do it. And they may go three or four, maybe they go a week, maybe they go two weeks. And they don't have any, you know, and they're, they're waging war. Maybe they make a mistake. Yet they get back up, they repent, God, I don't want that. And they wage war against it. And God keeps in doing them with strength to be able to overcome it. That's, what it. that's a repentant heart. That's a spirit of obedience. That's somebody who doesn't want to live in compromise and wants to overcome because they know it's about the deepest level of my heart. And one thing I want to say about this also 
is that when we talk about Jesus the judge seeing the inward part of your heart, it puts that godly fear on the inside of people where, man, he sees all the bad. But just because Jesus is a judge and he looks at the inward, it's not just that he sees the bad. He also sees the desire to do right even when you struggle and compromise. And we learned that from the Song of Solomon that Jesus sees the seed form virtues and the values even if they're in seed form. My, my obedience might be small. My, 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 I might be just starting the journey. Yet God sees, God sees, I see that. And I judge you according to your desire to do right even when you're struggling. And I will give you the power to overcome if you will keep pushing forward and keep going deeper in me. I love that about the church of Sardis. The church of Philadelphia is so powerful because this is the one that has the keys of David. And Jesus says, I am the one that shuts and no man opens. And I'm the one that opens and no man shuts. And a lot of times people use this, uh, this phrase in the way in which uh, opening your heart to God, just the same as the church of Laodicea. But the thing I want you to understand is Jesus is speaking to a church of believers. And this is where you see a very strong encouragement in the body of Christ that there is nothing that can hold you back from fulfilling the call of God on your life. Because Jesus tells the church of Philadelphia, he goes, you are facing all this persecution. You have all of these things coming against you. And he says, if you will remain faithful and if you will continue to go, listen, nothing can stop you from fulfilling my plan for you. Because if I open the door, there is nothing no thing that can stop it. You ready for this? Not even you can stop the door from being opened. When Jesus opens that door for your life, that door is opened. Now, the only thing that can stop you is you walking through the door, meaning your own act of obedience. Dr. Summerall used to say, and I, I, I use this phrase all the time, the only losers are the ones who quit, so don't quit. Meaning that if you quit, you stop yourself. But if you don't quit, you will always receive. You will always walk through these open doors because Jesus says, I opened it and there is no thing in the world. There is nothing that can stop you. There is nothing that can stop it. There's nothing that can close it. So if somebody, your family, your boss, your, even your church, your elders, whoever, they say, well, that's, you know, they pronounce or they start to say anything against the promise of God. Listen, they have no say in it. They don't decide what door is open in your life. Only God does. Jesus says, I open that door. And when I open that door for you, there's not a person on this earth that can stop that door from being open. And it will remain open for you. But Jesus also says, I'll close these doors. And when I close the door, the doors close. You cannot open the door that I closed. And we thank God for that truth because when he closes doors and when he opens doors, this is the truth we know. He has the wisdom and the resolve to lead us into the glory because man in and of them own selves does not have the wisdom or the resolve to know what's right for our life because we may think that that's, that's the door we want. That's the promotion. That's the job. That's the spouse. That's the thing we want. Jesus is saying, that's actually not what you want. Because that door would lead to death and I'm closing it and keeping it from you on purpose. And then we look at the church of Laodicea as we go to finish. And the church of Laodicea, I think out of the seven, is the one that most people know about. It's this one or Ephesus. Like I said, I, I believe the church of Thyatira is just as valuable in today's culture as church of Laodicea. But the church of Laodicea is powerful because it says... You're neither hot nor cold, but you're lukewarm. You ready for this? If you were to eat soup, there's cold soup that's really good. You know, and, and, and you like that coldness, especially on a hot day. And then you get this hot soup, and hot soup's good because it's hot. But then there's the soup that's kind of been sitting on the counter for a couple hours, and it's just lukewarm. And you go to you go to you go to sip it and you uh and it's just it's it's not good. You gotta spit it out. You know, it's like I, I need to put it back in the microwave. Or if it's a cold soup or like a cold drink, you, you want to put some more ice cubes in. It's got it's one of the polar extremes. That that lukewarmness just doesn't fit right. When it says, I will spew thee out of my mouth, it's talking about, and, it, and a lot of translations say, I will vomit you. 
It's because it sickens and it pains me. It's not because I dislike you. It's not because I hate you. It's because it pains me that you're in this state. Now, here's something I want to say. Them that are hot, it is very easy to stay hot. Them that are cold, it is easy to get hot. Get to a decision point. Here's what you see. If you see a person that's far away from the Lord, disconnected and they're cold and they're sick and you manifest the power of God and they get healed, that's easy for that person to get hot for the Lord. Boom, that's easy. The person that's already hot, seeing the manifestation of God goes even hotter. But it's that person that's lukewarm. It's just kind of somewhere in the middle, straddling the fence. You know, I got some money. I don't really need anything. This is, you, you see this in the Western church, especially in the Church of America, so strong right now. You know, I go to church. I'm a little in. Maybe I read my Bible once a week. But then, you know, if football is on, then that's more important than talking about the Lord. Or if this is going on, that's more important about the, well, you know, I got Jesus. We did that whole church thing today. I don't need, and, and, the, and it becomes lukewarm. You become like a straddling of the fence. And because of that, you are miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You don't even know. Jesus said, you don't even know that you are not in me right now. You, you have no part in me. I will put you away. You have to make a decision. And I wish I, could have, I wish we had more time today to go into this more in detail. But the thing I want you to understand about it is to make a decision. The anointing with eye slave is so important because Ananias came to Saul and he anointed his eyes and, and his eyes opened. And then he immediately went and preached in the synagogue and Saul became Paul. I want you to think of that revelation when you think about the church of uh, the Laodiceans. Because at that moment, he came to a decision point in life. You're either all in or all out. Stop straddling the fence. And that's, that's probably the biggest understanding of Laodicea. We're out of time today. Like I said, if this has stirred your heart, get our end times curriculums. Then you can learn more about each of these churches. But we're going to finish here for today. So, Father, I thank you. Bless everybody under the sound of my voice. I give you all the glory for it. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day. And we will see you tomorrow. The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow. Oh, the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons. The drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water. Isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good care of me. And you know what I need before I even ask the thing. And you hold me in your hands with the kindness that never ends. And carry The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care.